this is basically a really shortened down version of my dissertation, so I apologize, there's gonna be a lot of gaps. Um, that being said, uh, Lawrence Lessig once suggested that we are turning our children into pirates through our inadequate understanding of the creative process and the limitations of current copyright laws. Lessig was referring to the trend towards remixing as the form of creative expression in the age of the internet. I'm focusing on the mashup here, really to talk about digital cultural production and how we can start to uh, think about a second order cybernetics of digital technology and how it comes to influencing how we share, remix, and perceive the consequences of that sharing and receiving. So, what is a mashup? The mashup is quite simply a mashing up of various cultural phenomena. Mashups, audio and otherwise, all follow a similar logic. Pulling pieces of copyrighted culture apart, and, or often copyrighted culture apart, and then reassembling them into newly recombined cultural artifacts. Mashups are interesting not only because they are popular, but as will become evident, also serve as an apt metaphor for cultural production and communication systems in general, and how to rethink media's role within these systems. In the days of analog recording and production, whether a fancy studio or trying to dub a, uh, uh, on a dual cassette player, making a mixtape or whatever, uh, recording and copying needed to be done in real time with precision. You might remember uh, that each subsequent transfer of material continued to lose uh, fidelity and uh, transmission, of course, was through sneaker nets as you pass around mixtapes to your friends. Uh, digital recordings employ a much different logic predicated on much different architecture. Rather than utilizing an analogous system of compression and storage, such as grooves on a record to store sound waves, digital recordings utilize a digital file of ones and zeros to store information, which is then translated by software and hardware to reproduce sound waves. Looping a piece of audio can be achieved with fantastically accurate results in moments only using digital audio editing software. This ease of replicability translates not only to easy cutting and pasting snippets of audio, but also for sharing and mass distribution. Despite its popularity, mashups have not been without legal and economic pushback. DJ Danger Mouse's The Grey Album from 2004, which is a mashup, if you don't know about it, you should listen to it, was a mashup between Jay-Z's 2003 The Black Album and Beatles' famous uh, 1968 White Album. It was hailed by Rolling Stone as the ultimate remix record. The album was met with cease and desist letters from EMI, sparking a subsequent online protest against these takedown notices on 20, uh, February 24th, 2004, known as Grey Tuesday. Dubbed an online protest for copyright reform, 170 sites hosted uh, the Grey album for download, despite persistent takedown notices, over 100,000 copies were downloaded on Grey Tuesday alone. Uh, Charles Fairchild uh, notes that these declarations, declarations of civil disobedience were, quote, part of a larger culture that was daydreaming new ways to connect with the world, end quote. However, Sir Paul McCartney did not have a problem with the Grey Album, stating that, quote, it's exactly what we did in the beginning, introducing black soul music to a mass white audience. It's come full circle. It's, well, cool. The grist for the vocals, Jay-Z, was also a fan of the Grey Album, telling Fresh Air, quote, I was honored to be on, quote, unquote, the same album uh, with the Beatles, end quote. The only players that took issue with this album were the rights holders. Rather than the ultimate, we might consider the Grey Album as a marker of a still emerging phenomenon, one evident in the artistic practice of the mashup and all of its determinations, as well of, as well of those of its circulation. Cutting up two albums into an audio mashup was just the beginning, as Girl Talk here uh, synthesizes up to 280 different songs together in one particular track. Uh, in, 1776, uh, in 1676, Sir Isaac Newton famously remarked, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Newton was, of course, in good company uh, with George Herbert back in 1651 and Bernard de Chart back in 1159, and more recently, Lawrence Lessig has simply declared that creativity and innovation always build on the past. However, as, Laura, as Lessig argues, the most unbalanced regulatory constraint in cultural production today is from law, and it seems to forget this simple, timeless fact about creativity and innovation. 
The Constitution of the United States echoes this sentiment, seeking, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, end quote. This was granting authors and inventors the rights to publish their work for a period of 14 years with renewal for another 14. This changed many times over the years in 1831, 1909, 1976, and 1998, which passed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act and the Di Digital Millennium Copyright Act. <clears throat> One of the main reasons mashups continue to exist is through utilizing a fair use argument. Fair use was considered common law for many years beforehand, but it was finally outlined in the Copyright Act of 1976 as a way to allow use of copyrighted work without liability or infringement. However, fair use has often been illustrated as difficult to understand and best to avoid. This puts authors in a terrible predicament, as authors are expected not only to understand this complex legal argument, but also to respond to machine-automated requests in order to exercise their rights, um, responding to automated takedown requests from bots. The mashup is evidence of a different and competing philosophy, which continues to flourish. The mashup spreads this philosophy not through legal pressures, uh, but instead through its technical form. Uh, <clears throat> so we can frame this exploration through two incredibly short assertions. First, Friedrich Nietzsche remarked briefly that regarding the use of this typewriter, um, our writing tools are also working on our thoughts. The second is the deceivingly simple statement by Marshall McLuhan that the medium is the message, and in combination with his other famous statement, the medium is the massage, a more accurate description of media start to form. Media are both the systems through which messages flow as well as the determinant of the message itself. Taken this way, we could read McLuhan's statements together as the message of the medium is the manner of its massage. Combined with Nietzsche's statement, we can start to think about how the tools in which we create recombine and circulate messages, our implements of inscription and reinscription follow this principle, and of course, how those reinscribed agents continue along that path. Of course, this goes, uh, this idea of mediums mutating messages has been a concern for thousands of years. Uh, going back to the Phaedrus, Plato argues, among other things, that writing is external to the human, and writing starts to supplement with hypo hypomnesis, uh, Socrates went so far as to refer to written uh, text as a drug, a pharmacon, enjoying, enjoying the use of these drugs as a way to supplement his addiction to knowledge that usually kept him in the city. This word pharmacon is interesting for a couple reasons. Um, <clears throat> first, as, uh, uh, as Derrida points out in Plato's Pharmacy, the pharmacon holds dual meaning, both remedy and poison, but also because this drug is something that is taken external that is something external that must be taken internally for the desired effect to take place. Derrida's reading of Plato here hints at the transformative practice of media, not only mutating messages, but mutating the communicative subject. However, the subject is not alone communicating into thin air, but instead in relationship with others and different mediums that it ingests. <clears throat> I'm sure you're very familiar with the early cybernetic theorist Claude Shannon's model of communication, but what's fa fascinating is that what um, McLuhan said about this model, saying, what they call noise, I call the medium. That is, all the side effects, all the intended patterns and changes. Situating media as both uh, this determination of messages, but also something that is taken internally, that changes us, as well as involved in this cybernetic feedback loop, is helpful to understand how these messages function. Of course, Donna Haraway has famously noted that we are already cyborgs uh, by eroding this artificially imposed boundaries between national and natural and artificial, uh, and understanding that all humans engage in this communicative feedback loop that is, as noted by Derrida, supplementary and both internal and external, we can start to uh, reconstitute a better understanding of the subject in communication with technical media determinants. Uh, <clears throat> Krippendorf's understanding of second order cybernetics is helpful here as well, as each component is understood as connected. Not just humans in communication, but different components of each communication systems, as well as the particular relations between them. 
Krippendorf's conceptual conceptualization of cybernetic systems moves beyond thinking of just the subject, but how each piece in play is affected by each other. We can start to trace these things back more astutely by in, uh, implementing an archaeology of the Foucauldian type to understand the discursive formations that operate beneath the consciousness of individual subjects. Kittler here uh, helps situate Foucault's noble investigative processes along technical media lines. Kittler helps to shift a conceptualization of Foucault's process of archaeology towards an engagement with a different and arguably more primary piece of the historical puzzle, technical media. An investigation of these media systems that circulate and disseminate messages allow us to ask questions not about what's just going on, but how these systems have become naturalized and how these systems have gained control over the conceptual possibilities that determine the boundaries of thought. Uh, because the experience of the mashup is so important, uh, I'm, I really, and I haven't spent enough time letting you experience what I'm talking about, this is a clip from a uh, girl, tech, uh, girl talk entitled Jump On Stage. So was this a uh, jump on stage or what? Um, so copyrighted works must be located in a fixed medium and therefore loca uh, locatable. They must be clearly seen and recognized. However apparent the individual clips might be, they no longer appear in their fixed location and form. What mashup artists specialize in is dislocating the audible referent or other reference um, from uh, and relocating this reference among other dislocated reference. These mashups not only question and undermine the authority of copyright law, but they undermine the authority of the fixed location of creative works, the sacred institution of copyrightable authorship. According to Alex Galloway, uh, the interface of these technical media have an ethic. They do things. The experience of the mashup is an ethic of multiplying, of sharing, and recombination. The experience and ethic is normal because it has been the history and culture of cultural production throughout all of human history. The renormalization of the experience of sharing <coughs> of is that has been something that is determined as legal. This is old. Napster here, um, that is illegal or improper and abnormal, puts the mashup in direct confrontation with the cyborg subject's experience of the world, <clears throat> forcing a re-understanding of what is normal. <clears throat> so as, Lessig, uh, as mentioned before, Lessig suggests that we are turning our children into pirates. The turning that comes from technical media is not simply determinate in the traditional sense, but the turning that comes from technical media is also a cybernetic one, that in conversation and discourse with the determined media. Because, according to Haraway, we have always been cyborg, this cybernetic metaphor is not a new framework. Cyborgs are in conversation, and these conversations can mutate the pieces of the larger system. These cyborg pirates, I can't believe I found a cyborg pirate. Uh, these cyborg pirates are not only determined and named by the force of the law, but the piratization of the always already cyborg also comes from the continuing cyborgization of the subject, evolving its horizon of opportunities through the interaction with digital media sharing, creation, and ingestion. Each interaction changes the cybernetic subject's various components that form the cybernetic relationship constitutive of the cyborg, as well as the pirate press gang. These exchanges of messages happen through at least three modes of interaction. First of all, the cyborg interacts with the simplicity of digital circulation, whether this is the click of a mouse uh, or of a, a finger on a, 
uh, iPad or whatever for a share, a send, or a download, or an upload button. This requires the subject to comport themselves through a particular interface. The ease of circulation of messages, of passing along pieces of perfectly copied data, sends its own message to the subject, one that helps to inform the subject about the further circulation of messages, that access to the circulation is free and easy, and it should remain to, uh, so to continue the circulation for others. Secondly, the construction of the mashup uh, carries with it the structure, uh, uh, the structure of the mashup, that snippets and shreds of recognizable culture that have been pulled apart and, and tinkered with have now been reassembled. This message identifies itself to the subject that is one is constructed from various pieces of culture carrying the possibility of its own construction. This is a physical inter interaction that audibly destroys the notion of, fix, uh, of owned fixation. The cyborg pirate here now not only shares freely, but understands of copyrighted cultural artifacts as fair. Finally, through the participation of these digital mediated communities, whether a lurker or active conspirator, the subject becomes the recipient of the circulated messages addressing the subject as participant and addressing, uh, <clears throat> and in that addressing, carry with them narratives, narratives of agency, encouraged to participate in a variety of forms on a variety of projects. The pirate turn is more than just a turn that spreads messages. This turn has multiple interlocking parts, a second order cybernetic relationship where the turn towards access, agency, and participation also influences the future of the proverbial glove as it continues to influence the proverbial hand. This mutation is not one that just circulates messages, but circulates messages to those who create and upgrade the circulation machines, instructing the new machines to circulate messages better, more efficiently, and more openly inviting to the next wave of cyborg pirates. This is just one piece within the history of media interaction, one that has been covered by many, including Stephen Levy, Fred Turner, and Tom Streeter, all outlining ethical underpinnings of these systems with, which begat new systems. Through continued cybernetic evolution, each piece within this larger media system is slowly reshaped and reformulated via the embedded ethic of digital technical media. These messages continue to participate within the larger constellation of, mes of message circulation, slowly changing the face of everything around them. In short, Lessig was right. We are turning children into pirates. We are all turning into pirates. However, it is not because mashups are actually piracy we are turning to pirates because we are, there are competing social, economic, and uh, architectural determinations that are pulling, pulling us in multiple directions. And the influence of digital media and the mashup here in particular are really uh, there before any other conscious or unconscious determinants take hold. Mashups are obviously fair in both common sense and legal terms, which helps to reinforce what is already known by the subject of the mashup, that culture is theirs to play with, to tinker with, and to share. The mashup spreads hidden messages of fair use, encouraging others to borrow and remix, rethinking the way we approach what we know is copyrighted content. The medium is both a me affecting our messages and it is defining the system of conceptual possibilities that determine the boundaries of thought.